randomness? Well, basically the way that, um, I, ex that I experience my own work is actually um, seeing algorithms as a kind of like a potential parameter space and then <clears throat> figuring out optimal uh, configurations within that space, but allowing enough randomness to be in there so that there are things that happen that I didn't um, anticipate. Uh, because actually, typically humans are like not necessarily the best um, at, at sort of exploring the full parameter, parameter space. It's actually good to use randomness as a way to sort of search through that space. So I typically, early on in a, in a piece, I, I, I leave the parameters kind of wide open so that I get results that are kind of, you know, wide out, you know, wildly out of the playing field and then I narrow it down after. So in a sense, you're fractured. Uh, basically, I dropped out of computer science. That's where I started. Uh, my, but like going back further, I started programming when I was like 11, 12. Um, and literally, I've been doing randomized graphics for you know 30 years now. Um, but I did take a lot of influence from graphic design in the, in the 90s. And also, at the time, I found the art world not so welcoming. I mean, it's not like it's welcoming now, but it's, I've just come to terms with it. Um, but so I have a grounding in graphic design, but I was never a graphic designer. Uh, people sometimes ask me, why do you do what you do? And actually the, the sort of real answer for me is because these things are in my head. Uh, I, I do these things because those are things, structures that I sort of somehow perceive. I mean, I'm not claiming to be a synesthete or, or anything like that, but literally these are structures that I sort of find myself wondering about and then I explore them. Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's very much a, a continuing process of exploration, of discovering one form or one structure uh, or, you know, a, an approach to a certain uh, algorithm and then um, seeing where that takes me. And then the next time I wake up in the morning and think, like, I have to make a new piece, I might build on something that exists already or I might take it somewhere else. And, and for me, you know, I might take it somewhere else. And, and for me, in my practice, um, one of the things that drives me on and on is the fact that I, I keep jumping from medium to medium. So I've been working a lot with... Uh, physical production and you know digital fabrication and that's pushed my work into areas that I would never have explored if I was only exploring image surfaces and, and so so the metaphor of the artist as gardener does come up quite a bit when in relationship to code and it has some 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 uh, relevance for me I sometimes use that approach. Sometimes I actually literally set up a system to generate 100 random variations and then I pick between them. Other times it's a much more sort of tightly controlled system. Um, I don't typically like systems where I'm controlling all the parameters. That's, that's not something I normally do. Um, there might be situations in which that's something you want, but I prefer to find forms instead of sort of you know, top down designing them from 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 you know from scratch. Um, I tip, I actually think it's a it's a it's a little dirtier than that. We're not sort of you know just wandering around in a pretty garden finding beautiful things. It's a little more complicated. Well, okay. The way that I really see it is that. Um, Yes, I am approaching a sort of an potentially infinite space of uh, possible outcomes, but um, but I am also I'm shaping that possible space. I mean, uh, just by existing humans constrain randomness. Uh, so the idea of like authorless, you know, generative works, I don't believe in at all, because the work does not exist apart from its creation by the author. Um, that said, you can put into it um, ways of, of sort of co-discovering with machines. That's actually something I'm, I'm, I'm fond of talking about, like, um, you know, co-discovery with the algorithm, like actually figuring out um, things that you might not have found out on your own. But it doesn't mean that the, that the algorithm gains agency or that it's uh, creating itself, because it isn't. I mean, unless you're doing something extremely esoteric, the algorithm is defined quite tightly by, by the author. Um, you know, writing code can be messy. Uh, you, you know, sometimes you, you, you write a really ugly hack and it produces better work than like the most elegant code you've ever written. Uh, and uh, I've, I've had my work being called techno rococo and ultimately if, if that's a good term to you, I'm fine with it. If it's a bad term to you, I, I, you know, I still sleep at night. Uh, uh, the idea of beauty, I think, is, uh, I think it's a, more a question that like the art world actually gave up on beauty uh, as a sort of designator of good work. Uh, and the design world actually ran with it. I mean, there was a huge movement in, in the two, 2000s of sort of neo-ornamentation and some beautiful work was done. Um, work, but 
in my work, when, when I create it, what triggers me is often some kind of aesthetic experience. So the image that I'm going to stop at and say, wow, that's amazing, uh, is often one that is quite sumptuous. And that's, that's my visual bias you know, coming through. I don't create the work look, thinking of the, use, or the viewer or user as like, oh, they're going to think this is so beautiful. It just happens that these are the images just that excite me. And because I come from, I mean, a lot of my work is influenced by, by sort of the, the electronic music scene and even the rave scene where um, where music was a very physical and sensory experience where you did not isolate between you know this this the sensory experience of being in that space and sort of intellectual experience of listening to music so uh, so my works I, I see my works in that sense that like I actually would like to I would like to reach your uh, cerebral cortex before you have the time to filter your perceptions through cultural uh, conventions. Basically, I want to reach your brain by you know, using really bold colors before you have the prejudice to say like, oh, that's some techno bullshit I don't need to pay attention to. Uh, and <clears throat> well, I, I mean, this is an interesting question because I mean, okay, so if you go to like Southeast Asia, you have um, suddenly you have like cultures where like the, the lines and uh, you know, crosses of, of Western culture are, 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 you know, they're suddenly they're Bessier curves everywhere and they're beautiful curves and they're kind of, you know, and deeply embedded in the culture. And to me, obviously, um, some of those, those cultural artifacts are presets that we, that we learn to adapt to. But I do think that um, the human sensory system actually comes with a certain bias towards certain forms. Um, so, but yeah, I do believe that there are there are there are types of aesthetic experiences that simply transcend, and which uh, and often those the kind of um, aesthetic experiences that I'm really interested in are the ones that transcend uh, preconceptions or you know like something that you've seen before. I'm quite interested in, in seeing what happens when you construct a space that maybe feels in many ways inhuman. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that that's what I'm doing, but if you look at if uh, the work of, for instance, Ryoshi Ikeda, you know that work has no reference in nature. Um, it's a very artificial digital space that is created, uh, and I think in some of my work that also comes in because it's not a reference to a natural structure. It, in fact, it is a structure that only exists as a result of of digital processes. Yeah, and in a... I would never say I, I don't see the technological and the human as a sort of pure opposition. I, I think there is definitely there is a certain opposition there, but um, but we have co-evolved with our tools for so long now that to think that humans can be um, uh, you know can be humans without technology is like thinking that dogs will be dogs without humans. You know, it, it's, the species have kind of you know co-evolved. Uh, not that technology is a species, but um, but I think that. You know, for instance, if you take the, the whole debate around new aesthetics, uh, I think, you know, the fact that there are cultural artifacts that are out there that are genuinely new and really pretty alien to us and that we are nevertheless learning to live with is just a given fact. Uh, whether or not you believe it's a big movement or a giant change, that's a whole other issue. But to, but to, to sort of deny that, that Google Maps is changing how we see the world uh, is kind of naive. Hmm. Realizing that someone actually does need to point out these artifacts and, and problematize them in a way. And if we don't, then we are actually just slaves to the technology. Actually, new aesthetics for me is not about um, celebrating blindly like, oh, isn't technology great? It's partly about saying like, these things are out there and we need to know about them. Otherwise, we are simply ignorant of the world that we are creating. And in which case you can take the sort of the, the white male technocrat, you know, like hedge money, that will just go on if no one criticizes it. Uh, and, and new aesthetics, even if it's mostly been created by white males, it, it still, you know, it goes in that direction towards saying, hold on, there is something we need to examine. And it's uh, is it a problem that we fetishize newness? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, but I've been living in a state of newness since I was 10 years old, and I think all humans are. Uh, and it's something that we have to navigate in some way. Um, I think it's a problem if we, you know, if you know, overnight you pick up a, a smartphone and you just go, oh, now I have a smartphone and I don't think about what that means. Uh, I think it's a problem if you don't think about what changes you're under, you know, undergoing. I mean, you know, for instance, parents need to think about how old do they want their kids to be when they get, you know, mobile phones. I mean, that's a relevant, critical question that you have to post to the technology. But I, but there is no, there's no way that I personally, for instance, could stop living in a state of newness. I mean, I, I get, I, you know, I get asked to like, oh, what do you think about the future? And and actually, I think about the future very little because I'm so busy dealing with what's already going on around me, and it's changing, you know, you know, month by month.
So you really, you know, like, uh, you know, I have a 3D printer on my desk, you know, uh, and that 3D printer in probably a year will be a better 3D printer and it'll do different things. And, you know, every, you know, every month I get, you know, talk to people who are like, oh, by the way, we have a robotic seven axis arm. Do you want to do something with that? And, and so my world just keeps expanding in this direction. Uh, and I welcome it because that's that's part of what my work is, is predicated upon. Uh, and I also welcome it as a way of sort of just never stopping. Uh, of course, there might be a time, you know, later on where I'm, you know, where I find it a little more, more difficult to sort of adapt to this. But um, but I'm thoroughly enjoying it at the moment. Can you, can you speak? Fact is, uh, I very much saw it as my my role to um, deal with software as pure form, as software as a sort of an artwork in itself. And I was very concerned with that and explore that in different ways. And then at some point I realized that, but hang on, I'm I'm a little fed up with doing projections. I'm I'm fed up of like ha always having a screen or some kind of uh, mediating surface you know, trans translating my work from this like idealized digital world into a representation that exists in the physical. Um, I was very obvious that in architecture, graphic design, and in arts, you were seeing computation and code being approached in completely new ways. And the people who were doing it across these different realms were actually dealing with a lot of the same problems, but they, haven't, they had no way of talking about it. And they weren't particularly being respected in their respective fields. So Generator X, where is that? I mean, I, I hate the word nerd because it implies that, you know, oh, that's some like meaningless knowledge we don't need to wor worry about. Uh, in fact, I would say that like, you know, for us not to end up with technocrats ruling the world, uh, this needs to, to, to filter down to uh, broader critical practices. I, uh, I believe in Darwinism. Uh, I believe in like stylistic Darwinism in that like when some really good work is done, it will basically um, crowd out all the bad work in a certain way. So I'm just hoping that like people keep doing really good work. But it's also, I don't deal with the reality that I deal with is, a, is, a, is one of a utopian space of form. Uh, basically, you know, if, if you ask me like, what, what is your work about? Like, what does these structures mean? Ultimately, they don't refer to anything outside themselves. So the only reality that they inhabit is their own reality. It's their own space. It's a, you know, I, I could wax lyrical about sort of, you know, an imaginary, you know, alternate universe, but that's not really how I see it. I see each form that I create as inhabiting its own space, and I'm trying to explore what that space sort of implies for the form. Um, and then seeing, and if it's if it's interesting, then it goes somewhere. If not, I abandon it. But it but it exists in its own kind of virtualized reality. Um, my, my I would say that like, you know, the 90s would have been very difficult to understand without cyberpunk as some kind of cultural background. Um, and now the irony is that we are the cyborgs that were described. <laughs> we just don't think about ourselves that way. And, you know, an iPhone is this gleaming, you know, beautiful device that doesn't feel very threatening, but is doing really messed up things to your cultural space. Uh, and people aren't considering this. So the, the aren't considering this. So the, the cyberpunk dystopia, I mean, in terms of where the world is in, you know, financially has totally come true. I mean, you know, things are just hugely messed up, but uh, people are still thinking that like they've isolated themselves from the sort of technological dystopia, but in some ways we've completely, uh, you know, embraced it, you know, through Facebook and Google and, and whatnot. I think like if the cyberpunk authors had described Google and Facebook, we would have said, oh yeah, that's science fiction for you. It's never going to happen. And I mean, similar in the sense that in a way, it's simply a matter of pointing out things that are obvious when you think about them. I, I ran around uh, in the early 90s, like really annoying people at parties talking about how great the internet was going to be. For me, that was an absolutely inherent res you know, result of the internet existing. Uh, but I think, uh, I think one thing that's going to happen is uh, what we now see as full color 3D printing will just get better and better to the point where you're actually literally scanning and printing something in full color, um, you know, right off the bat. And I think that's actually, that's probably even just two years away uh, for that to become a really good technology. Right. Um, you know, Ikea's monopoly on, on, on flat packed furniture is actually ridiculous in the world of, of digital fabrication. There's no reason why we shouldn't have uh, designers creating, you know, fantastical, you know, flat packed design structures or non-flat pack that you assemble um, and, and create according to specifications, which is which is a world which both for designers and artists, um, you know, like I could uh, I could create a um, specifications for a public sculpture. I ship a file to, you know, Toronto and they create this like giant piece out of it um, that actually in the sense of like there are generation shifts. Um, 
there's now a genuinely a full gener new generation of people making work, which is quite different from, for instance, the work that, that I'm doing or Golan Levin is or Casey Rees is, uh, and they have different concerns. At the same time, people like me are passing into a role of being, you know, what in the art world is called a mid-career artist, which which is a, means that your your interests are going to change, uh, and you're also going to start doing projects that would deal less with just like, you know, putting yourself out there in the world, but also dealing more with like a kind of posterity and and sort of figuring out like, okay, what is it that I'm really trying to say and saying that in a more mature way. Uh, at the same time, I think there's going to be multiple generation shifts uh, that are happening, and and to me that's actually one of the most fantastic things out there. Like literally, I'm I'm looking forward to being surprised completely by why by what people are doing with with these kind of technologies I mean when the connect typically early on in a, in a piece I, I I leave the parameters kind of wide open so that I get results that are kind of you know wide out you know wildly out of the playing field and then I narrow it down after so in a sense you're not for me. I mean, I know coders who are much more, um, you know, goal-driven to begin with. I tend to explore, um, and I'm, and I also, I also, also always keep the door open to discovering things that I didn't anticipate. Are you? Are you in this? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. So Carl Sims did some work in the, you know, in the '90s that was really, really interesting, both with uh, evolving these artificial creatures that were like swimming and figuring out like forms of sort of uh, locomotion on their own. I mean, that work is totally fascinating. Um, to me, the idea of creating a work that that has its own in its kernel kind of a way of designing itself um, that's such a sort of set piece that's you're talking kind of like uh, you know uh, Harold Cohen's Aaron robot etc like that is a sort of a life's work uh, I mean more I would rather make a hundred pieces that are less idealized in their construction um, aesthetics uh, I think you know the fact that there are cultural artifacts that are out there that are genuinely new and really pretty alien to us, and that we are nevertheless learning to live with, is just a given fact. Uh, whether or not you believe it's a big movement or a giant change, that's a whole other issue. But to but to to sort of deny that that Google Maps is changing how we see the world, uh, is kind of naive.